hopeless. These books are useless and I don't know anything about the church in the early days of the colony. I wonder if Dad can help. Hey, Dad, what do you know? Everything, Anne. Perhaps you could be a bit more specific. Yeah, all right. It was just a figure of speech. I've got this really scuzzy assignment on the church in the early days, and I was wondering if you could give me some info? Yes, I can, Anne. Well? Well. A shaft dug into the ground to obtain oil or water. No, no, you're supposed to tell me about religion in the early days. Now, you didn't ask me to tell you about it, Anne. You only asked if I could tell you about it. To which I replied, yes. Oh, you're so picky. All right, tell me about religion in the early days. Could you be more specific, please, Anne? Oh, I don't know. Start at the beginning. As you wish, Anne. As far back as human memory can reach, this country has been inhabited by religious people. Over 50,000 years ago, the Aboriginal people occupied this land, believing that they were created here at the time of the dreaming. Until only 200 years ago, they were the sole owners of this continent, living in 600 tribal groups and speaking about 300 different languages. In that time, they had evolved a unique and beautiful religion, one that was rich in legends of how this world and they themselves were created. How the rocks, trees and waterfalls are dwelling places of the unborn spirits of animals, birds and people. The Aborigines didn't build shrines to their gods or their dead, but they moved and dwelt among spirits. Their land was sacred, having evolved a close relationship to it over many thousands of years. Their lifestyle was simple and nomadic. The Aborigines didn't hoard food. They never wasted it or took more than they needed. Each person had a special relationship to some part of nature, which affected many areas of his or her life. Their laws and religion were complex and sophisticated. They had a unified and beautiful culture. Well, that's very interesting, Dad. But what's it got to do with church history? Hmm. You did say to start at the beginning, Anne. There were religious people here before the first Europeans arrived, though the Europeans didn't appreciate the Aborigines' way of life. Oh. So what happened then? I was just getting to that, Anne, when you interrupted me. Well, excuse me. You're excused, Anne. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Into the peaceful world of the Aborigines, which had been virtually untouched by other cultures for thousands of years, there arrived in 1788, from far off England, a fleet of 11 ships carrying around 1,000 Europeans. They had come to establish a colony for Great Britain, a colony made up of perhaps the strangest assortment of settlers that any new land had ever seen. You are now looking at Sydney Cove today, Anne, the site of the first white settlement in this country. Here, 200 years ago, by the bank of a small freshwater stream, Australia's first governor, Captain Arthur Phillip, raised the British flag and drank a toast to the new settlement. It was the 26th of January, 1788. OK, the English have arrived. Now let's take a quick look at some early churches and we're as good as finished the assignment. It's not quite that simple, Anne. There are a number of social, political and religious issues and government policies to explore if we're going to cover the topic properly. Yuck. Sounds boring. Anyway, aren't you supposed to do whatever I instruct you to? I have my pride, Anne. 
All right, all right. You win. Tell me about it. Well, to start with, Anne, the settlers were not all English, as you just implied. There were a small number of Irish convicts with the First Fleet. The recognised religion in England was Church of England, or Anglican as it's also called, whereas the Irish were generally Catholics. Being an English colony, the only religion the government encouraged was the Church of England. This monument marks the spot where the Reverend Richard Johnson of the Church of England held the first Christian church service in this country. Here on the 3rd of February, 1788, all the troops and convicts gathered under some trees and listened to Johnson's service. I take as my text today, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? <laughs> From then, everyone in the colony had to attend Sunday Anglican service regardless of their religion. <laughs> Governor Philip was instructed to do this because it was felt in England that attending church was a good way of helping to keep order and encourage respect for authority. <laughs> Philip ordered that any person who failed to attend church was to have their rations halved. As time went by, the number of Irish transported to the colonies increased dramatically. There was a lot of unrest in Ireland because the people were governed by the British. They passed laws that forbade the Irish from voting, sitting in Parliament, holding public office and even having schools. I didn't know that. Obviously. Well, what happened? The Irish clung to the Catholic religion fervently, which isn't surprising since it was about all they had left. However, the conditions in Ireland drove many of them to crime and to being anti-British about everything. In 1798, hundreds of Irish, Protestant and Catholic, took up whatever weapons they could lay their hands on and moved against the British. The rebellion was crushed and hundreds of Irish were arrested, some unjustly. Between 1798 and 1803, many were sent to the colony in Australia. By this time, the colony was making progress. The early threat of starvation had been overcome. Emancipated convicts and free settlers had been granted land. Crops and livestock were beginning to flourish. At the very beginning, the colony had always had a hospital, but it wasn't until 1793 that there was a church, St. Philip's Anglican Church. Reverend Richard Johnson himself paid for it to be built. Convicts, however, burnt it down five years later. Catholics all this time had no priest. An Irish priest who requested to come to the colony with the First Fleet was refused permission. In 1792, five emancipist Catholics petitioned Governor Philip for a priest. Surely we've got a right to our own church services. The petitioners claimed that they had a right to their own church services. Convicts, however, were not considered to have rights. In 1796, there was another petition. 
This time, the Catholics used language the governor would understand. A priest in the colony would improve the convict's behavior. Yeah. What he said. So, did a priest come? No. And the petitioning continued. The governor was unsure about having priests in the colony. Would the priest encourage the convicts to behave? Or would he encourage rebellion? In fact, in 1800, some of the Irish convicts were flogged for planning an insurrection. A convict priest, Father Harold, was thought to have had something to do with it. It's beginning to dawn on me just how complicated it all must have been. The governors didn't trust the priests because they confused being Irish with being Catholic with being anti-British. And of course, for some Irish, that was the case. How did they behave once they arrived here? That's hard to say because they tended to be stereotyped then in much the same way that migrants are today. Many, of course, once they were pardoned, became useful citizens. But others continued their lives of crime. Yeah. I guess if there weren't any schools in Ireland, then many of them wouldn't have been educated. Very good, Anne. Also, many only spoke Gaelic, the Irish language, not English, which caused a lot of problems. Who's that Father Harold that you mentioned earlier? I thought no priests were allowed in the colony. Fathers Dixon, Harold and O'Neill arrived in the colony during 1800 and 1801 with other Irish rebels. It is not known for certain about Harold, but Dixon and O'Neill were definitely arrested unjustly. As a matter of fact, Anne, O'Neill went back to Ireland in 1802 when his name was cleared. So at last there were priests in the colony. Were they allowed to say mass? Not publicly. The governor would have been worried about rebellion amongst the Irish. Yes, Anne. The English were in continual fear of an Irish rebellion in the settlement. Also, Governor King didn't trust Father Harold, though he liked Father Dixon. Finally, Governor King did allow Dixon to say mass publicly. He thought this would improve the behavior of the convicts. to grant unto the Reverend Mr. Dixon a conditional emancipation to enable him to exercise his clerical functions as a Roman Catholic priest. Father Dixon was given a conditional pardon and permission to celebrate the Mass and administer the sacraments. But he had to be careful not to preach rebellion. And effect, ...so long as he, the said Reverend Mr. Dixon, and no other priest, shall strictly adhere to the rules and regulations which he has this day bound himself by oath to observe, as well as all other. Some members of the community set about preparing for the first mass. And here, near Argyle Street in the Rocks, on the 15th of May, 1803, the first Catholic mass was celebrated in the small home of ex-convict James Meehan. I bet that made a lot of people happy. I'm sure it did, Anne. However, there were some members of the settlement who were less than pleased. The Reverend Samuel Marsden, who was the presiding Anglican minister at the time, said, If the Catholic Mass is allowed, the colony would be lost to the Empire within a year. What a grouch! Well, as a matter of fact, Anne, there was a rebellion the following year at Castle Hill. Proclamation by Philip Gidley King, Esquire. Insurrection. At half past eleven o'clock on Sunday night. Over 300 convicts, many of whom were Irish, attempted to march on Parramatta. The rising was quickly quelled, but the blame was placed entirely on the Irish. In fact, Father Dixon was accused of being involved with the rebellion, even though he had tried to stop it. Governor King revoked Father Dixon's authority to celebrate Mass publicly, though surprisingly he still allowed Dixon to perform baptisms and marriages. Father Dixon left the colony early in 1809. So no priests again. That's correct, Anne. Once Father Harold left in 1810, the Catholic lay people were the ones who kept religion alive. 
In Parramatta, Liverpool and Campbelltown, groups of Catholics would get together for prayer meetings. James Dempsey would say prayers with the men condemned to be hanged, and Michael Hayes continually wrote to his brother, a priest in Ireland, asking for a priest to be sent. So a priest must have arrived eventually. Yes, but not for another seven years. Father Jeremiah O'Flynn arrived in 1817. He had official authority from the church in Rome, but unfortunately not from Lord Bathurst, the Secretary of State for Colonies, who thought he was ill-educated. Father O'Flynn had met Michael Hayes's brother while in Rome, and impressed by the need for a priest in the colonies, he took it upon himself to come. Governor Macquarie, however, was not prepared to allow Father O'Flynn to minister publicly.